Well, good morning, everyone. It's always good to see the uh, fellowship and communion with the saints. Today I'm going to be uh, sharing a passage of scripture with you from Colossians chapter 3. So if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3. If you don't have your Bible with you, you can grab one of the brown books in front of the pew and in front of you. It's page 834, page 834 if you need the page number. Well, uh, Tom tries to gear me in here. I, I like a ring around my finger, but not around my ears, right? All right, Colossians chapter 3. Now, if you would ask me, um, what's my favorite passage of Scripture? For those of you that hear me teach in Sunday school, you'll say, well, all your, all your passages are your favorite passages of Scripture. But honestly, this Colossians chapter 3 is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Um, this is one of the passages of Scripture that I go to when things aren't right in my mind. When I need a refresher from the Lord, when I need a proper perspective on things, this is the passage of Scripture I like to go to. And, and it kind of restores my mind, restores my perspective on things in the world. So if you... Now, since I'm going to be jumping right into the center of Colossians chapter 3, let me give you a little bit of a flyover to, to let you know where we're going and before we land right at uh, Colossians chapter 3. Now, the letter of Colossians was written to the believers in the town of Colossae. Now, if we look actually in Colossians chapter 2, verse 1, you'll see there at the very end of verse number 1, that Paul was writing to those who did not personally see his face. In other words, this wasn't a church that Paul had started. In fact, this was most likely a church that was started by or probably led by a gentleman by the name of Epaphras. And if you look in chapter 1, verse 7, Paul actually mentions this gentleman. I like what Paul says about him here in verse uh, number 7, chapter 1. He says, calls him, our beloved fellow bond servant or servant who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. So this was the uh, letter of Colossae was going to these people that Epaphras was uh, pretty much leading up and had been teaching. But Paul had a reason for writing. All of Paul's letters, you, when you study through them, you, you need to stop and ask yourself, well, what was his reason for writing? Paul gives a number of reasons for writing at the beginning of chapter 1, and he also dives into a few more reasons in chapter 2. But the primary reasons for his writing was so that the people would have a well-rounded, good understanding of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. Because there was a few false teachings that were coming into the church, and he wanted to correct these and make sure that the people knew who Jesus Christ is. Um, now, one of the things I, I like pointing out in here, if you ever need a good, thorough, yet concise description of who Jesus is, take somebody to Colossians and have them read chapters 1 and 2. Of anywhere in Scripture, you're going to find more about who Jesus is and what he has done in those first two chapters. A, a lot of people like looking at the books that Paul writes and says, well, he really writes two books. The first half of Paul's books is always about doctrine or teaching. He sets foundational truths. And then what he does after that is he sends the second half of his book telling you how to personally live out what he has just taught. And that's exactly what happens here in Colossians chapter uh, 1 and 2 is the doctrinal part. And in chapter 3 starts more of the living out of your life with Jesus Christ. Now, Paul introduces some topics here, which is what I'm going to be keying on on today. And he really introduces the theme in chapter 2, verse 6. So if you flip a page over, if you have it there, chapter 2, verse 6, he writes, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus our Lord, so walk in him. What Paul is talking about is he's just talked to them about this union that they have in Christ Jesus. And he, he will in a few verses thereafter. So what he does in chapter 3 is he tells you 
how you can walk in union with Jesus Christ. Now, how do we walk in union with Jesus Christ? It's all about a relationship. The Christian life is all about a relationship with Jesus Christ. It is a union with Jesus Christ. Our faith is dependent upon this union that we have with Jesus Christ. And you, you might be looking at me like, okay, I don't know that I've heard this before. Well, let me show you. Paul writes about this. Now, the key word for today, you know, like you have sometimes a key word. The key word today is the word with. So whenever I read the word with, take special notice of it today, all right? So let's look, first of all, as an introduction here in chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. Chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, talk about this union that believers have with Jesus Christ. So let me read here. It says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together, how? With him, having forgiven us all of our transgressions. And I like this in verse 14. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So when Christ died, it was the same as if we had died with him. And in the same way, when Christ rose from the dead, it is as if we also raised from the dead in newness of life because we really do have a new life, new life in Christ. We have an eternal life in Christ. Now, this passage of Scripture in verse number 14, I like this where it talks about the decrees against us. You know, in the news we're hearing about loan forgiveness. Now, this is really loan. This is debt forgiveness here. This reminds me of the greasy spoons that I had gone to as a kid where the waitress would, would hand write uh, uh, on the green paper your bill up for you and tally it, put it on your, on your uh, table, and you would take that piece of paper and go up to the front counter where there'd be the register, and the lady at the register would, would uh, figure it out and say, okay, you owe us this much, and you, of course, put a tip on the table. And, and what does the lady at the register do? She has this spiky thing sitting on the counter next to her that has, looks like a really sharp nail. And she puts her fingers apart. She grabs the paper and goes, thunk, right? And she sticks that piece of paper on. What does she mean? That debt's been paid off. And this is exactly what I think of. This is a picture here is our debt was as if it was nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. So when Christ died on the cross, it is as if we also died there, but he died in our place. But our debt was stuck on the cross with him. And that's the picture that he, he has here. The debt's been paid. So what I want to portray today in the sermon is practical living instructions for walking or living in union with Jesus Christ. And we'll get this from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 is what we'll cover today. So Colossians chapter 3, let me read verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. I like outlines. I'm one of those guys that has to have an outline to do anything. Even at work, I have to spell out my tasks of how I'm going to do things. Because it helps me organize my thoughts. It lets me know where my direction is and where I need to go. For this particular passage of Scripture in chapter 3, verses 1 through 17, I have a simple outline that I like to use. It's a two-word outline. And all of the outline points, all three points, start with the word put. All right? The first point in verses 1 through 4 is put with. Simple outline point, right? Put with. I'll explain it in a minute. Second outline point, verses 5 through 9, is to put off. And then verses 10 through 17 are to put on. So what are you put with? You're put with Christ in verses 1 through 4. What do you put off in verses 5 through 9? You put off the flesh and the deeds of the flesh. That's, this is talking to believers now. And in verses 10 through 17, what do you put on? 
you put on the new self. You're living the new life that you have in Jesus Christ. You are living with his characteristics. It's like you're putting off and putting, putting off the dirty clothes, putting on the clean clothes. But it starts with the put with. So remember I said the key word for the day is the word with. How many times did you catch the word with when I read verses one through four? Did you catch it there? Did you catch how many times I, I read it? Now, not all translations have the word with all, all number of times there, but they should have caught three times there. So let me see if we can point those out for you here. First of all, you have in verse one, you have raised up with Christ, verse number one. Verse number three, Verse number three, you have the phrase hidden with Christ. And then in verse number four, you have either revealed with him or appear with him. And of course, the him there is referring to Jesus Christ. So this gives us a really neat three-point outline. Here, we're good at three-point outlines today. Three-point outline for verses one through four. The first point is having been raised up with Christ. That's point number one from verse one. Verses 2 and 3, then we are hidden with Christ. Verse 4, then, we have been revealed with Christ. So Paul begins his practical instructions into the letter of, of Colossians in how in giving instructions in how we might live in union with Jesus Christ and having believers actually see things from Christ's perspective with Christ. So here's my theme for the Sunday sermon, if you saw it in the bulletin. It's living the Christian life, which starts by seeing things from Christ's perspective in life. So what's Paul talking about? Paul's talking about the mind here. For those of you that uh, work in sports, as we know Bob works in sports, this is a phrase that he probably is very familiar with. And if you've ever played sports, like in elementary or high school or something, you've heard this statement before where a coach will yell you out, Get your mind in the game, right? You've heard that. What's he mean? Well, he knows if you're out thinking about something else, you're not going to be actually able to play the game well because your mind is distracted by something else. So this is what Paul is doing here is he wants you to get your mind in the game because he recognizes if your mind is not with Christ, you're going to stumble in your walk. It starts with your mind. It starts with having a mind with Christ or in union with Christ. So let's go ahead and jump into then verse number one of Colossians chapter three. It's the starting phrase says, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ. Okay, let's pause there a second. You see the if there? If there is a, we call it an if then clause. I, I work in software development. I write programs. We write if then statements, which basically means if this is true, then this will occur or this happens. So it's a conditional clause. If this is true, or, and, we, and for our particular sake, we have to assume that it is, then such and such will occur. So what Paul is saying here, he's, he's actually using this kind of like a rhetorical question where you're asking it for the purpose of trying to get the individual to think here. So Paul's doing that here with this if-then clause. He wants you to think. So he's asking here, if you have been raised up with Christ, and he wants you to pause, think about it, have I been raised up with Christ? Then he says, then keep seeking the things above where Christ is. So, have you been raised up with Christ? We, we got into this a little bit in Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Let me read chapter, verse 12 again of chapter 2. and says, we have been buried with him and baptized, in which you were also, what? Raised up with him through faith. So this faith that Paul is talking about here is the same faith that Jesus Christ says in John chapter 5, verse 24, one of my favorite verses too, by the way, is he says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. It doesn't say you will have, or that you have to do anything there. It's just belief. And you has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death, what? Into life. This is the life that we have here. So that is the raised up to newness of life. 
So God has offered a forgiveness from sin through faith in Jesus Christ. So when Jesus Christ died, it is as if we died. This is this union in Christ. When he was raised, it is as if we were raised. We were raised from spiritual death into eternal spiritual life. Now, it talks about a position that Paul talks about a position here in verse number one that we need to be seeing Christ from, a perspective. Where is Christ described in verse number one? He's described as being seated at the right hand of God, seated in heaven. So if we have been raised up with Christ, we're supposed to be seeking Christ from things above, from this heavenly position. Now, you might be saying to yourself, how can I do that? I'm still down here, right? He's up in heaven. Well, how about if you have a seat next to him? Would that do it for you? Do you know if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, you have a seat next to him? Oh, let me show you. This is great. Ephesians chapter 2. I'll read you this. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 4 through 6. It says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And get this, verse 6. And raised us up together with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You have a seat in heaven. How does that work? I don't totally know. I, I kind of take it more like what Peter does. Peter kind of describes this a little bit in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, where he talks about that to receive an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So in my perspective, I'm looking at this as a reservation. How many of you guys ever gotten ball tickets to a game that you were just thrilled, you couldn't wait, your seats were the best seats in the house? All you can think about before that game is what it's going to be like to seat and that seat, right? Um, I, I've done that with a few basketball games when, I was, when the Sonics were actually somebody in Seattle, Washington. We had Sonics tickets, and we got as, as close as we could afford. Wonderful tickets. But all you can think about, I was a high school kid, I played basketball, I, all I could think about was going to that game. I, nothing else could come on my mind. This is the same way that Paul wants it. He wants this to be nothing else on your mind but being with Christ because you too are seated with him in the heavenlies. You have a guaranteed reservation through the Holy Spirit. So from this perspective, let me give you another illustration. In high school, my brother and I used to like to go hiking a bit. And we lived in Seattle, Washington, and we would occasionally take hiking. We'd go hiking with another friend who was a little bit older with us that my parents thought was responsible. And we would go hiking into the peaks of the Cascade Mountains. You know, you see on the TV where those mountain peaks are like this, and you see the guys work, walking on them, and the mountain goes off on both sides like this. Well, we used to walk along those peaks. And it was amazing how your perspective of things changes while you're there. You feel the temperatures change quickly. You smell the fresh mountain air. Oh, the blueberries are wonderful. There are bears eating your blueberries. Um, this has all happened. And what's really amazing is everything back at school, homework, kind of fades away from your mind. Instead, the things that become important are things like safety, shelter, and food. Your perspective totally changes based upon where you're at. This is what Paul's trying to get at here. He wants you to have Christ's perspective of things so that you and he will have the same priorities in your life. Because if you have his perspective, you're going to have his priorities. So the first perspective is that of being raised up with Christ. The second perspective in verses 2 and 3 is being hidden with Christ. But it starts off interesting in verse number 2. It says, set your mind on things above. Well, this is different than verse number 1. Did you notice in verse number 1 it says to seek? So you're supposed to be seeking in verse 1. You're supposed to be set in verse 2. So what's the difference here? Seeking has the idea of desiring after, and it's a continual thing. So Paul was telling us to continually seek after Christ. Here is a different mindset, though. It's to be intent on, to be set, to be 
um, set in your mind. L let me give you an illustration of this. In World War II, there was a young Christian who came in enthusiastically into a meeting and was mentioned to an older Christian believer. He says, I understand our bombers were over the enemy's territories again last night. And he was thrilled. To this, the elder believer replied, I didn't know that the church of God had bombers. You see, the issue is there, the old man had already set his mind on Christ. The things of the world, the things of the war that was going on was not on his mind. His mind was set on Jesus Christ. But we think about this in our daily activities now. We have a lot of things that come on the news. Nothing is ever good on the news, or almost nothing is ever good on the news anymore. And we sometimes fill our mind with this, and it disturbs us. It's not something good. Instead, we need to be setting our mind on Christ. It's something you have to choose to do. You have to say, okay, I'm not going to turn on that news tonight because I want to, don't want my focus on Christ to be disturbed. So we need to set our mind on Christ. Now it says here, he adds on to the next phrase, he says, not on the things that are on the earth. So we're supposed to be thinking about things above, but he contrasts it with not on the things that are on the earth. Paul writes about this in Philippians chapter 3, and he warns about those that have set their mind on the things on the earth. I'll read to you a passage in Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Philippians 3, 18 and 19, it says, For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, and whose end is destruction, and whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame. Now get this, it says, who set their minds on earthly things. So the warning here that Paul gives us in Colossians is that we are not to be like these individuals, to set our mind on earthly things, because it can cause us to fall. So what's the best way to not get our minds on earthly things, to not be distracted by earthly things? Well, it's in the next verse. It says, For you are dead. Have you ever seen a dead person concerned about any earthly things? No, it's not on his mind, right? It's the same way here. For you are dead, he brings out here. You're not to be distracted by the world because you have died in Christ. So how has the believer died? Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. I'll read those for you. Romans chapter 6, verse 11 says, Even can so consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. What he's saying here is, basically, sin doesn't have a control over us anymore. We're no longer under its grip. We don't have to sin, and I don't let it control you. He continues in verse 12 and saying, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. So in the sense that when we have died with Christ, Sin does not no longer have control over us, no longer has rule over us or reign over us. It's because of that certificate of debt that's been nailed to the cross. It's not there. You can tell Satan, nope, it's been nailed to the cross. My sin is covered. It's been taken care of. Now look at this next phrase in verse number three. It says, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. What are we hidden from? You ask yourself that before? Are you hidden right now? It says you're hidden. First John tells us, what are we hidden from? We're hidden from the world. Let me read to you from First John chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. In fact, I'm going to start in the middle of verse 1 here. It says, For this reason the world doesn't know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, we are the children of God, and it has not yet appeared as what we will be, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. So we are hidden from the world until we will be revealed with Jesus Christ. Now imagine this. If at the moment you trusted in Jesus Christ, you immediately received your glorified form, what would that do to people around you? That would scare them to death, honestly. Think about this, even just with Moses, when he would spend the time up with God in the mountain, and he came down, what did they make him do? 
They made him cover his face because his face was glowing so brightly. If we receive the glory of Jesus Christ at the moment we trusted in him, people would go, whoa, amazed. We would scare everybody to death. We would really rather scare them into life, right? So we don't want to do that. So right now we are hidden in our present form from the world. I imagine this a lot like a bride. The bride is in her room preparing herself, getting all doodaddied up and ready to make up the hair. Everything is all getting perfect until, and she's hidden from the groom and the audience until the door is open. The music starts and you see here comes the bride. That is going to be us. We are hidden in Christ until that particular time. So for right now, Christ's glory and our glory or glorification is hidden from the world. So from our outline here, the first perspective was we are raised with Christ. Next perspective is we, have, we are hidden with Christ. Third perspective is when we are revealed with Christ. This is in verse number four. It says, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed. Let me pause there. Question to ask you. It says here, when Christ, who is our life, is Christ your life? And you ask yourself, well, what do you mean by that? Uh, probably the best way to explain it is to think about, think about you when you were engaged to be married. Or think about a young couple that you know that that is recently engaged to be married or newly wed. If you go and talk to them, it doesn't matter what you talk about, in some way the fiancé or the spouse is going to come up in that conversation. And if you ask them, oh, you think you'd be available to do whatever on a certain date, they would have to say, oh, I'll have to check with my spouse or I'll have to check with my fiancé, right? Because their mind is so much on the other individual. Their life is with that other individual. For Paul, it was the same way. For Paul, Christ was his life. Paul wrote about nothing but Jesus Christ. Paul lived for Jesus Christ. In fact, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. There's the union with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So are you ready to be revealed? Paul was ready to be revealed. In fact, he wrote about this in Romans 8, 19, 8, 18 and 19. Let me read you this. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not to be worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. The sons of God, that's us. It says that all creation is eagerly waiting for us to be revealed. So when Christ returns and is revealed in his glory, where are you going to be? Where am I going to be? We're going to be with him from his perspective of life. This is what Paul wants us to set our mind on. When we come and we're revealed with him, we are going to be a dazzling and fearful sight to the rest of the world because we will be revealed with him. So Paul begins his practical instructions in verses 1 through 4 with living in union with Jesus Christ by having the believers see Christ or see things from Christ's perspective with Christ. I want to point out one last thing. Did you notice when I gave you the outline the different tenses there in verses 1 through 4? It says that we have been raised with Christ. If you have trusted in Jesus Christ, it's a done deal. If you haven't trusted in Jesus Christ, come talk to me. I will tell you how you can trust in Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. Second, it says we are hidden. That's present tense. That's now. That's our, our state right now from Christ's perspective. The third, it says we will be revealed with him. That's a future tense. So he has given you back a past, a present, and a future thought to be putting your mind on so that your mind is with Christ in all things. Why? Because living the Christian life starts with seeing things from Christ's perspective. If you want to continue to see things from Christ's perspective this week, you need to be in his word. In fact, 
Paul closes this whole section in verses 1 through 17 with this very fact. Let me close with reading verses 16 and 17 where he says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, and with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for the perspective that Paul gives us here with Christ. We ask, Lord, that to forgive us of the times when we come astray, we get our mindset on the world, we get distracted by the world. Lord, forgive us of that. May this week, as we go forward in our Christian walk, may you guide us from your word, and may our perspective be with Christ, so that we may see things from your perspective. And we will thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we will have our, our time of the Lord's Supper. If you haven't had the opportunity to, to get a cup and bread, go ahead and come forward and grab that at this time. While everybody is coming and getting the bread and cup, we're going to give you a little bit of time. Where it says in 1 Corinthians 11, 28, it says, But each man is must examine himself, and in so doing, he has to eat the bread and to drink the cup. So let's go ahead and take a few minutes to examine our hearts with the Lord, and then we'll partake together. Our Heavenly Father, according to your Son's request, we come together at this time to remember you, to remember your Son, to remember the torture and the pain that he bore on his body on our behalf as symbolized by his body, by, by this bread. We also remember your Son's shed blood, which cleanses us from sin and is symbolized through this cup. And we ask, Lord, in our thoughts and our prayers, as we remember your son, that you'd be honored in this, and for this we give, us, give you our thanks in Jesus' name. The Lord's Supper was meant to be one of the most unifying ordinances that the church could do together, the body of Christ. Unlike baptism, baptism was meant to be done uh, out and open where others would see as a testimony of uh, Jesus Christ. But the Lord's Supper was to come together as Jesus requested as a remembrance. And it was done to be, to be done amongst other brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. It's unifying in that it unifies our focus on Jesus Christ and our worship on Jesus Christ. Uh, in it, if you think about it, we all come to the same level. We all come recognizing that there is nothing in us and through us that is deserving of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. And that's why we come here remembering him, because it is only through him that we have life. And his body is actually used to represent his life that he gave. His body was nailed to the cross along with all the, the decrees against us as we discussed in Colossians 2.14. So when he was nailed to the cross, he was nailed for our sin all the torture that he went through, 
all the pain that he bore on our behalf was for us. And he asked us in the Last Supper that we'd, we would remember this, remember what he was doing for you and I. So, Paul writes then in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. 24, he says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is broken, which is for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread in remembrance of Jesus' body. Now also, as Jesus requested, he asked us to remember his blood. Blood signifies that it has left the body. It also means then that if the blood shed had left the body, he died. It proves his death by his shed blood. So when we remember his shed blood, we remember that Jesus Christ died. It also represents his forgiveness of sin, his cleansing from sin. So when we take, his, take this cup, we're doing it in remembrance of the payment that he made for us. By looking at this, this was the cost that it cost him. So Paul writes again in 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 20, or 25 and 26, In the same way he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let's take the cup together in remembrance of Jesus Christ's blood. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, his body, his blood that he shed. And in this we do remember until the day you come again and we give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Are dismissed. If you like this, to take a few minutes, uh, get a drink, uh, use the